Hello, I hope you can hear me clearly. I'm John Brace and I'm going to be filming a series of videos as due to the half-term holidays next week there's a shortage of public meetings. So I thought I'd start off by looking at one of the bigger stories on my blog this week. That was about uh, what I said at a meeting of the Merced Fire and Rescue Authority to the Chair Councillor Dave Van Ratty and his response about councillors' expenses. I suppose I'd better briefly explain uh, what the situation is regarding councillors' expenses and allowances. Councillors on the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority are entitled to claim expenses, for instance, for travel to public meetings, and each year they're supposed to publish a table detailing each councillor's name and how much has been spent over the year in expenses for that particular councillor in various categories. In fact, that's a legal requirement, a very basic level of transparency. However, unfortunately, what uh, Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service were doing was where they were invoiced directly rather than councillors claiming back expenses that they'd incurred themselves. So, for instance, uh, where trips were booked through capita, train travel, that kind of thing. Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service were invoiced directly, but this wasn't appearing on the actual annual list, so about 6,000 or so expenses were being left off. So I uh, have been pointing this out over the past few months. There's also the issue that councillors get paid allowances and on this national insurance and presumably things like income tax are paid. Now those amounts weren't included in the annually published list either. I did ask uh, Councillor Hanratty earlier, I think it was the day before yesterday, whether these uh, amounts would be included in future, didn't get an answer. Asked a question about this at the Birkenhead Constituency Committee, told it was a matter for Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service slash Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority. I think they don't want to give me answers on this, as I think they hope I'll just stop writing about it and move on to other things. After all, I think there are far less councillors getting a taxi from home to the public meetings now since I started publishing what these expenses were for. Anyway, another um, news story that seems to be popular on the blog is that. Uh, Mersey Travel's Chief Executive David Brown is leaving, I think he's leaving from uh, some, some time uh, next month, to become Chief Executive of Transport for the North. Uh, obviously that will be news for people that work at Mersey Travel, and uh, I suppose you're wondering what Transport for the North is. Well, it's a new kind of regional body that's been set up regarding uh, transport matters, uh, and eventually it'll become like Mayor's Travel is, the combined authority, a statutory body. So I wish him luck in his new job, and I think the Deputy Chief Executive Frank Rogers will be acting Chief Executive until the councillors decide on who the permanent Chief Executive should be, which will come to a future meeting in the future. Anyway, uh, another uh, thing I've written about on the blog recently is to do with the whole Lindell School closure matter. Now. For those who have been following this story, this is probably going to repeat what you already know, but Royal Council officers said that the reason the school had to close was that from 2016-17, which is the next academic year, that funding that they'd get for education from the government would be based on pupil numbers rather than place numbers. Now at the moment, I think uh, there were about 40 places at Lindell School and about, must be about a dozen or so pupils. So basically they were saying that for next year there will be a shortfall in Lindale School's budget. But this hasn't happened. The cabinet still decided to close the school, but the funding changes haven't happened. Will Council get the same funding as they did the previous year? However, despite them getting the same funding, they have actually made cuts from the SEN budget because there is flexibility at World Council in that they can move money around within the education budget. So they've got to spend it on education, but they can move money around from, say, that allocated for teaching assistance for special educational needs to something else within that education budget. And one of the things that's been causing pressures on the budget is that they have a massive contract, I think it's about halfway through, 30 years or something. I read through the contract and it would take too long to go into here, but it's a contract with World Schools Services Limited uh, 
but basically it was rebuild a number of schools. But as well as the payments that relate to that, there were also payments of millions a year, I think, that the schools have to pay this private company for services to do with the schools, for instance. I think uh, school meals is part of it, uh, possibly cleaning and maintenance. So the situation had been that World Council was getting a grant from the government for some of this. But the contract meant that the costs were rising each year for PFI. What was happening was this money was being funded outside the education budget by World Council. But then a political decision was made not to do this, which meant a few million had to be cut out of the education budget elsewhere. Hence why special educational needs got cut. But again, one of the other interesting twists and turns that came out in the Lindale School Saga is that the whole issue of whether the school should be closed or not seemed to arise around the time there was a revaluation of the land and buildings. Off the top of my head, I think the valuation was about 2.4 million. I better make it clear at this stage this is a what they call a technical what's it called? Depreciated replacement cost value. It's not a they send in a state agent and they say, well, how much would we get for this and how much would we get for the school playfields? No, it's it's more of a they have to have on their asset list a list of how much their assets are, because obviously, as a council, they have liabilities and they have to offset that with their assets. But it's a great shame what happened regarding Lindell School. It's not closed yet. It'll close at the end academic year. But I think it could have been handled a lot better. Obviously, there have been recent revelations come out that the person that chaired the consultation meetings on the Lindell school closure wasn't, in fact, a World Council employee, but is a, what do you call it, a, a temp, a temporary worker, because they couldn't recruit somebody to the post. He's called Phil Ward, and the problem was that there was... Quite a bit of criticism levelled at him for the way he chaired the consultation meetings. Now, obviously, you can criticise anybody for chairing a high-profile consultation meetings. I'm sure there were criticisms of how uh, Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority did their consultation meetings. But moving back to Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority, the Sogel Massey issue, it was agreed by councillors on the Fire Authority to go ahead. They've agreed to four or so million pounds in the capital budget. And a planning application has been submitted. Now... I've checked on World Council's website and I can't see a planning application there yet. But obviously they have to scan it in and put it up on a website for consultations so people can get the comments and so on. The other issue is there was a, a vote recently on whether World Council should give the land or they may get something for it, I don't know, maybe they'll give it to them. Should give the land to Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority for this new fire station in Sogo Mercy. Now, that was a 5-4-5 five, five against vote with one abstention, so it got deferred to another meeting. Now, obviously, it would be better if World Council could make decisions reasonably quickly, but I understand the point that Council has made at the meeting, that they felt they were only hearing one side of the argument, and that they hadn't got the information in front of them regarding the emails that had been released under Freedom of Information Act requests. They hadn't heard the Fire and Rescue Service point of view, because nobody had been invited along from the Merced Fire and Rescue Service. And basically, better decisions are made by politicians when they have the facts in front of them. And they don't like making decisions if they're going to be made fools of later <laughs> when it turns out that something they should have known or was in the public domain. An example of that would be the New Brighton car parking for Perch Rock fiasco. Now, that went out to budget consultation, was agreed by council, was agreed by council. But what wasn't known at the time was that World Council had a lease for the Marine Point complex. And that lease said that if World Council introduced car parking charges at Fort Pedge Rock, that they could be introduced in the car parking elsewhere there. And uh, Liverpool Echo journalist, I think it was Liam Murphy, got in touch with the company that runs the 
Marine Point complex and they said yes they'd have to introduce charges because obviously if the World Council had introduced charges at Fort Perch Rock car park then it would have displaced some parking to the free parking elsewhere so then they'd feel they'd have to introduce charges themselves but once these matters came out then there was a U-turn done on it and they decided that they'll make up the budget shortfall somewhere else. But that goes back to my point about politicians having the information in front of them so they can make reasonably informed decisions. Now, the reports that go before officers, sorry, politicians, whether that's at World Council, Liverpool City Council, Merced Farm Rescue Service, Merced Trolls, are written by officers. That is employees of the particular public body that the politicians, that the politicians are politicians for. But there's a question of um, officers can have a particular point of view and make a recommendation and therefore ask the councillors to approve it. But officers aren't at actually going to know everything. But where does the public fit in all this? Because of course. In an ideal world, like for instance say, the planning commission yesterday where the public gets to speak for five minutes if they've got a qualifying position. In an ideal world, if you were making a decision, say a major decision about a fire station being built, or that's two decisions really, it's a planning decision and whether will council go to the land. But if you're making a major decision like that, then not only should you have some kind of consultation with the public, and by consultation I don't mean publishing the papers for the meeting a week before although that does give some advance warning so people can lobby the decision makers I'm talking about that people who are affected by a decision should, should have their say at a public meeting and I know there have been consultation meetings at the most side found rescue service for them, and that's fine but what I'm saying is the ball's now in World Council's court there has to be the usual consultation or planning applications but it's a very emotive issue and I think basically, if I can sum up the positions, Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service have received a grant for some of the cost of this fire station. And of course, with, with the West Kirby and Upton fire stations being closed, they'll receive something for the sale of those. But basically, they want to build it now in Salgot Massey because the site in Greasby has been withdrawn. But the problem is that this is green belt land and there's a lot of resistance from the residents regarding a fire station there. Now, in the not too distant past, Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service did put in a planning application for a temporary fire station in Oxton while Birkenhead Fire Station was being rebuilt. I know that was later withdrawn, but that caused a similar level of fuss and outrage and politicians saying they were against it and so on. But the problem was that that was only a temporary 12 month event which eventually they found some way around finding somewhere else. But the same issues that were brought up then have been brought up regarding the Sogamashi issue, you know, the issues regarding sirens, traffic and so on. But I think the elephant in the room really for Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service is that a number of the fire stations they've got are part of a PFI scheme so they can't close those without massive penalties. I mean I think Birkenhead Fire Station is one example of one of the fire stations they've got under this PFI scheme. So there are fire stations they can't shut so that leaves if want to make budget savings, for instance through cutting jobs and merging fire stations, they've only got the ones that aren't the PFI fire stations that they can choose from. And that's part of the reason why Upton and West Kirby got chosen. But I think one of the things that has probably got the public going is that after there was pressure put regarding the Greasby site, that the offer of Greasby where there's a library and community centre there was withdrawn and people are now asking why World Council isn't doing the same thing regarding Soccer Massey well basically these are decisions yet to be determined it's a party political matter because 
three political parties involved in the last decision on this voted three different ways. But I can see a problem because, firstly, Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service can't keep Upton and West Kirby Fire Station open. They just don't have the budget for the amount of firefighters that would take. Now one alternative is just keep Upton open. Now the downside to this, according to the Chief Fire Officer, is that this would increase response times to the Hoylake and West Kirby area. So that's why they were once somewhere roughly in between the two stations. However then of course people raise the issue of Upton's close to our park hospital so it'll take longer to get to there so wherever you have a fire station there'll be people that have a quick response time and people that have a slow response time. But the fire engines are always at the fire station all the time. I mean about half the time they'll be called out on a job or maybe a bit more than that. They'll be out somewhere else and that can't really be predicted where they'd be at, whether they'd be fitting a smoke alarm or something like that. So there are lots of issues to do with the Sogamassey fire station and basically I'll be reporting on it. But at the same time I think it's interesting seeing both the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority meetings and the World Council meetings and how this issue has been dealt with at both of them. Of course if the government hadn't offered Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service a large grant to build a new fire station there then I doubt this would have gone ahead. Admittedly, they could have borrowed the money or found the money from somewhere, but I think that what's interesting is I did make an FOI for the grant application that they made to DCLG. was told that this information will be published in the future, so I couldn't have it now, and I had to wait till after the consultations were finished. And by that, they didn't just mean the Upton and West Kirby consultations, but they meant the other consultations because this grant is not just for a fire station at Sogham Massey, there were similar consultations and mergers and closures happening elsewhere across Merseyside. So hopefully that will sum up things and I'll point out that tonight at the Walsey Constituency Committee, I won't be there, but I noticed because I read through the reports and the agenda that the motability, they have a little place in um, Birkenhead that has out wheelchairs and things like that are looking to set up a place in New Brighton so people can hire wheelchairs and that kind of thing. So that's a possibly positive move for New Brighton because I know there's been a lot of criticism at New Brighton and a large petition over the dropped car parking plans. Anyway, I better finish there for now, but thanks for listening.